ever since 2016, uh, we have imagined that there are all these red lines that once they're crossed, you know, that uh, certainly Trump's, you know, supporters will start deserting him because they'll realize this time he really has gone too far. And that moment has just never arrived. January 6th is the clearest example of that. Welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Brimmer, and let me give another big bear hug of a welcome to 2024, the year that everything finally works out just fine. I mean, if Taylor Swift can have a banger year, why can't the rest of us? Okay, here's a serious prediction 2024 will not be a good year, at least not politically, but it will be the most consequential for the future of democracy, both abroad and particularly here in the United States. As you'll see in my interview with Stanford political scientist Francis Fukuyama, the fates of governments around the world, from Turkey to Taiwan, may well rise or fall on the roller coaster of a year to come. But make no mistake, it will be the United States and its presidential election in November that will determine much of the fate of democracy more broadly. But first, Here's a statistic that may dampen your noble efforts at a dry January. A quarter of Americans believe that the FBI was behind January the 6th. Yes, that's right, 25% of Americans and more than three in 10 Republicans believe the falsehood that the Federal Bureau of Investigation conspired to cause the deadly Capitol riot. Heck, you may even be one of them. Shame, shame. New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, you're entitled to your own opinions not entitled to your own facts. But he was not around during social media. The fact is, this is how the insurrection at the Capitol started. We're gonna walk down to the Capitol and we're gonna cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not gonna be cheering so much for some of them. Now, I'm nonpartisan, always have been, never been a member of a political party, and I don't count myself in either the red or the blue camp. But I do firmly count myself as part of the sky is blue camp. And I think we should all be able to agree on basic facts like that. And yet, public trust in core U.S. institutions like Congress, judiciary, and the media is at historic lows. Polarization and partisanship, historic highs. To make matters worse, the two major parties, likely presidential candidates, are uniquely ill-suited, if not unfit, for office. Former President Donald Trump faces dozens of felony criminal charges, many directly related to his actions as president, January 6th being the tip of the iceberg. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden would be 86 years old at the end of his second term, a number that might match his disapproval rating by then. The majority of Americans, in short, want neither Biden nor Trump to lead the nation. But sticking our heads in the sand, we cannot. So let's game it out. If Trump wins the election, Biden will concede. But while Democratic leaders may be less likely to claim the election was rigged than the former president, they will treat Trump as illegitimate, believing he should be in jail because he's unfit for office. If Trump loses, he won't accept defeat. Instead, he will do everything in his power, legal or illegal, to contest the outcome and impugn the legitimacy of the process, especially because the stakes for him are much higher this time, he faces the prospect of prison time. And what if the world's most powerful country is unable to hold a free and fair election? Unlikely, and I hate to even think about it, but plausible. Efforts to subvert the election could come from cyber attacks, deep fakes, and disinformation. Physical attacks on election process and oversight and or even terrorism to disrupt voting on the day. There's no more geopolitically significant target than the upcoming U.S. ballot with plenty of foreign adversaries that would love nothing more than to see more chaos from the Americans. The United States is already the world's most divided and dysfunctional advanced industrial democracy and the 2024 election will exacerbate this problem no matter who wins. With the outcome of the vote essentially a coin toss, at least for now, I've no confidence in predicting who comes out on top, but just how we make that choice will determine if democracy itself wins or loses. Worried yet? Well, I'll say that's got the makings of a fun conversation, so let's have it. I'm joined now by Stanford's Francis Fukuyama. You can call him Frank. Frank Fukuyama, one of my favorite political scientists in the whole world. Thanks for joining us. 
Thanks for having me, Ian. So much I want to talk to you about, but I wanted to start with, it is the, uh, the Stockholm-based International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. And they say that half the world's countries are suffering from democratic decline. Now, I know we shouldn't trust the Swedes generally, <laughs> but on this one, uh, are they on board? Are they right? And what does it mean to you? Well, I think broadly, uh, there's been a recognition that we've been in a democratic recession really since about 2008 or so. Uh, there's only a small group of academics that for some reason disagree. But I think that uh, if you consider both quantitatively the number of backsliders and qualitatively at the kind of backsliding that's occurred, it's hard to uh, come to the conclusion that democracy is in good shape globally. You had the successful consolidation of two big authoritarian great powers, Russia and China, uh, who succeeded in you know, developing an economic model that looked sustainable, they were politically stable. But I think that the more troubling thing is what's been going on inside uh, democracies, where a lot of democracies simply have not delivered in terms of economic growth. Their governments haven't been able to uh, you know, provide that. Uh, in terms of levels of corruption, there are many countries that democratically elected governments that are stealing uh, you know, uh, from their own uh, people. Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons why democracy does not seem to be the kind of system that actually delivers the outcomes that were promised. And there probably was a little bit too much high expectation setting, you know, when uh, at the time that the Berlin Wall came down. Now, when I look at some of the countries that have been serious backsliders, um, you know, so hun Hungary, for example, Turkey, for example, I mean, the leaders of those countries, you, you wouldn't say that they are legitimate leaders as a consequence of that. Well, I think that both of them uh, won elections. I think, you know, in both cases, the government had so much control over the various levers of power that it's hard to say that either of them was elected through a free and fair uh, electoral process. On the other hand, I do think that we shouldn't kid ourselves that, uh, you know, this was just the work of a tiny elite minority that, that, you know, pulled the wool over everybody's eyes because there is some genuine popularity behind authoritarian government. You know, a better example of this is really El Salvador. El Salvador legitimately elected Nayib Bukele as president, but he embarked on this massive effort to simply round up uh, people that he thought were gang members and put them in prison. No trial, no um, judicial process to find out whether they're actually guilty or not. And as a result, like 10% of the you know, young men in the country are now sitting in prison. Uh, and it's been quite successful in reducing the level of gang violence in El Salvador by like 90%. And meanwhile, his approval, his approval ratings are also something like 90% right That's now. right. Why, I mean, looking at this one in particular, and I, you know, I remember, of course, when he came on board, he was well known for that and for you know, being a, a crypto tech bro, uh, that the latter hasn't worked out so well. But why, I mean, when this problem is so persistent through so many administrations across the political spectrum, why does it take a strong man who doesn't care about democracy to do anything about it. You know, what the rule of do law does is it puts constraints on the use of, among other things, police power. And so um, uh, Bukele has been putting these gang members in jail. In Salvador, it's a little bit easier because the gang members all have these tattoos that pretty clearly identify them as members of gangs. So they just round up anybody with a tattoo and stick them in jail. There's no court proceeding. There's And, and you know, in the process, uh, they arrest a lot of innocent people. So I think that, you know, in a liberal democracy, we deliberately constrain power. That's what makes a liberal democracy liberal rather than just a, you know, populist majoritarian democracy. But it does mean that there are certain things that we don't permit ourselves to do uh, uh, in the area of security and, and other things. So, I mean, there's, there's a good chance, right? I mean, that after they've arrested all the thugs, that for decades, El Salvador will never have a representative government again. If this guy decides that he's going to do whatever he wants, 
on other on, on corruption, you know, on basic economic services and the rest. The people are going to have no they'll have no method um, to redress that. Well, you know, this is a age old problem of authoritarian government. The Chinese have this um, story about good emperors and bad emperors. But what's happened in Chinese history is that you get good emperors on occasion, but more often you get bad emperors. And when you get a bad emperor, then you're really in trouble because you don't have any institutional constraints uh, and that bad emperor can do an incredible amount of damage uh, and there's really no way of stopping him until, you know, basically they die physically. And that was, I think, the problem with Mao Zedong. I think he was the last really bad emperor. We'll, we'll have to see about Xi Jinping. He, He's not looking so good either, but certainly Mao Zedong launched, you know, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution that were unbelievable catastrophes uh, for the society. And because you're relying basically on the goodwill of one individual, uh, you know, your chances of getting good outcomes at the other end over an extended period of time are low. Xi Jinping, you said, you know, you're not doing as well at this point. Now, certainly economically, he's not doing as well. The political consolidation seems very high. Uh, you know, kind of put your crystal ball on right now. What, what, where do you think the Chinese leadership and the political system is likely heading? We've had 40 years of this unprecedented human development under the China model, but we now have a much stronger leader than at any point since when that model started, since Mao. Um, and, you know, he's also, there are no more term limits. So if he wants, he can be in charge for life. Uh, what, what do you, where do you think that's going? Well, I think it, it leads to a potentially dangerous situation. I think that we probably hit peak China maybe five years ago, you know, before the pandemic started. And the pandemic has simply underlined the degree of economic uh, decline because they're simply never going to... Uh, go back to the kinds of growth levels that they experienced uh, as recently as 2019. Um, but they're still big and powerful, and they've got a lot of assets. And I think that one thing a lot of strategists worry about is that a great power that's past its peak and sees that it is going into a long-term decline may actually become more uh, aggressive uh, than one that's kind of secure in its, you know, thinking about its future. Uh, that's not a prediction because I, you know, I don't know how the Chinese leadership is interpreting their current situation, but certainly they have not backed off this rather forward and aggressive kind of foreign policy uh, that they've been running, you know, for the past, well, really through much of Xi Jinping's leadership uh, period. And that worries me a lot. Uh, it worries me particularly if you look at the balance of power because the U.S. isn't doing well right now. You know, I think we've been severely weakened by our internal divisions. And uh, I think that there may come a point where China feels that if they're going to ever move to reincorporate Taiwan, uh, that this might be the point where they're maximally strong and we're maximally weak. And that, you know, might set up a very risky decision on Xi Jinping's part. Well, certainly the U.S. is not maximally weak economically, militarily, or technologically, but politically, and political will is a different story. And uh, people, I'm sure, have been waiting for when we're going to turn to the United States. Uh, you've been outspoken. Uh, you are personally concerned about the state of democracy right now, uh, and certainly don't want people thinking it can never happen here. Uh, what, what can happen here? I mean, how worried should the Americans be approximately in the near term, in other words, after the next election, about the quote unquote end of democracy in the U.S.? Well, I think they should be very, very worried. Uh, and this is not reading tea leaves. If you listen uh, carefully to what uh, Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican candidate in 2024, has been saying, he's been pretty uh, explicit. You know, he wants to pull a Bukele type move. Uh, he was saying the, re the way you deal with shoplifters is you just shoot them dead as they come out of the store, right? No due process. Very simply, if you rob a store, you can fully expect to be shot as you are leaving that store. Shot. He has explicitly said that he wants to turn the Justice Department against his personal enemies, not just the so-called Biden crime family, but you know, all of the people in his own administration, his own first administration 
that have criticized him and, and turned against him. You know, the other thing that's quite worrisome is that he was limited in what he could do in his first term by, you know, incompetence, uh, unfamiliarity with the way government worked. He didn't come in with a big cadre of loyalists to help him. And so for the first three years, he really had to rely on the advice of so-called normie Republicans. Uh, this time around, they are busy compiling lists of people whose primary qualification is going to be uh, loyalty to the Trump agenda. And they want to hit the ground running in terms of accomplishing things that they couldn't accomplish. So it's not just the border wall, but increasing the weaponization of the Justice Department. They want to uh, clear out the civil service and fire, be able to fire uh, tens of thousands of uh, ordinary civil servants and replace them with people that will listen to the president and not to the Constitution or uh, to the rule of law. And so I think that, uh, you know, this is really what's happened in other countries that have slipped into dictatorship. The problem is that I think a lot of people on the left have been crying wolf for a long time. And so they, you know, they have accused many Republicans over the years, you know, people like Mitt Romney, who now looks like a, you know, a saint <laughs> for his willingness to criticize Trump. I mean, all of these these Republicans made mistakes and they had policy differences that were quite serious with people on the left, but they were never threats to democratic institutions Right, right. Um, you know, in themselves. And I think that's really the choice that we're going to face uh, in the upcoming presidential election. So if Trump wins, I mean, clearly he'll, he will uh, almost certainly have the House of Representatives with, with mostly loyal uh, members. He will very likely have the Senate with somewhat less loyal, but still reasonably loyal members. Um, the judiciary is different, of course. It remains independent. Uh, the, the military uh, remains professionalized and independent. Those seem fairly significant repositories of democratic resilience uh, in a country like the U.S. Tell me why they won't matter as much as they should. Well, they will matter, but I think that we may be facing a really unprecedented situation. So, for example, you know, the courts in this country uh, don't have any independent power. They don't have their own police or their own enforcement mechanism. And if the Supreme Court says you cannot ban all Muslims from entering the country, you can't uh, impose a religious test, as Trump has sort of suggested he might, uh, what's going to happen if a future court, even a Republican dominant or a conservative Supreme Court says, no, no, Mr. President, you can't do that, and he simply disregards that? I think that's entirely within the realm of possibility, given the direction that he has been going. The military, uh, you know, he uh, is not going to have yes men at the senior ranks, but he can replace them uh, as he uh, finds people that are loyalists. And, you know, from what I hear from some of my friends in the military, uh, the senior leadership is still normal. They, they really do believe in the Constitution and the rule of law. But there's a lot of support for Trump in the enlisted ranks and, you know, people further down. And so I think that it may take a little bit longer to subdue an institution like that. But I think that in four years, you know, it could uh, it could happen. And then there's, you know, there, there are shortcuts like the Insurrection Act, which uh, Trump threatened to use at the time of the George Floyd uh, protests. Uh, he didn't follow through on that. But again, the law there is poorly written, and it's not clear that he wouldn't be uh, able to actually call on the U.S. military on day one to actually put down a protest against, you know, uh, him. But the other thing that is very, very worrisome is that, you know, in a way, Trump is preparing for this moment when there's massive protests. And he's got a lot of supporters. Uh, many of them are armed. And I think that on January 6th, he showed that he was, you know, completely comfortable with calling on his friends to use violence to, you know, support his, uh, his ends. And so he might be able to get, you know, police and military to help him out this time, and he may use his own armed supporters. And that really sets up, you know, a, a scenario for serious violence. It is kind of remarkable that we <clears throat> have had a lot of threats of violence in the last, you know, several years, but we've not actually seen assassinations or, you know, 
overt, you know, gun battles between different uh, armed groups. But that's something that, you know, we may unfortunately see uh, down the road in the United States if things keep going in this direction. So I'm really, you know, very worried about uh, uh, the guardrails and whether they're really going to be in place uh, next year when, you know, when, when we really need them. I mean, to what extent is the problem that the United States hasn't really faced an internal crisis? I mean, January 6th at the end of the day, right? I mean, it, it looked horrible, but uh, that evening, you know, majority of Republicans in the House could go back in and vote to refuse to certify the election because they, they were complacent, because they said, well, there's no real threat to the democracy. Well, look, uh, ever since 2016, uh, we have imagined that there are all these red lines that once they're crossed, you know, that uh, certainly Trump's, you know, supporters will start deserting him because they'll realize this time he really has gone too far. And that moment has just never arrived. And January 6th is the clearest example of that. You know, I spent the whole day glued to, you know, my computer screen watching those events. And I said to myself, this is it. You know, they can't possibly uh, continue to support them. And yet, here we are uh, three years later, and they're all busy trying to normalize what happened on that day. So I'm really, you know, very worried about uh, uh, the guardrails and whether they're really going to be in place when we really need them. Frank Fukuyama, he's concerned. Maybe you should be too. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, Ian. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you've seen, or even if you don't, but you feel a little ennui, and you like ennui, though you don't know how to spell it, but you kind of like it, why don't you take a moment to sign up for our excellent daily newsletter. It's appropriately titled G-Zero Daily.